Okay, I want to go into a little bit of detail on how you interpret DNA sequencing. These are DNA sequencing reads. Remember I said you, got, you read 100 bases of DNA from either end of a 300 base fragment. So this is one end of a fragment. It's 100 bases of DNA. It's been matched to the reference genome. So this line up here is the reference genome. And what's happened here is an unusual event. This part of the read matches this part of the reference genome. The second part of the read matches a different part of the reference genome. So this is the reference genome ending at 29 million blah 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 on chromosome 2. And this is part of the reference genome at 28 million, so back earlier in, in, in the reference genome. So this is what's called a split read. Part of it matches one place in the genome, part of it matches another. Well, if you look at the, if you look at all of the, if you just look at the number of reads, so I'm plotting the depth of this stack here, you see across chromosome two, you see that there's a bunch of reads here and then suddenly there's a jump and there's a bunch of, there's extra reads throughout this whole thing. And if you take this read, let's say, and plot it, it, it matches here and then it goes back and matches here, all right? So this is pretty unassailable evidence, both from copy number and from these split reads, that in fact, this region of chromosome two is repeated twice in a row in the tumor. And we can map that down to the precise base where it was cut and duplicated. So that's a good case in which we can give a very precise to the base interpretation. There are other cases where it should be even simpler. There's a C that's changed to an A in the tumor. We should be able to see a bunch of C's where we're not, ex uh, a bunch of A's where we're not expecting them, right? So you actually take the very best programs. This is from the TCJ consortium, the leading group in the world now in cancer genomics and you give them the very same set of DNA reads from the normal tissue, from the tumor, and you ask them what are the mutations. Good news is they all agree on about 1,982 mutations. The bad news is that those groups also disagree on a bunch of mutations. So it turns out that there are lots of cases where it's not clear from the DNA whether there's a mutation there or not, and even the best systems don't agree. So we are actually running a benchmark, and if you're excited about this, go to cghub.ucse.edu and download Benchmark 4. You can actually compete to see whether your code uh, works better. So we go back and deeply sequence to a thousand depth, a thousand fold depth to see whether which ones of these are real or wrong and we score each other to see whether who is right or wrong. Uh, and this is a very active area of research. When it comes to structural changes, it's even more difficult. So if you're trying to call uh, whether a piece of chromosome 7 is connected to a piece of chromosome 10, as illustrated in this circular plot, so the genome goes chromosome 1, 2, 3, the reference genome counts around like clock here, and I can show with these lines that a piece of DNA in one chromosome is attached to a piece of DNA in another. Interpreting whether whether though which ones are real or not is 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 also tricky. How could you how could you make a mistake? Well, it turns out that there are lots of near duplicated regions in the genome, and so the the complexity of the genome itself. Are we losing a uh, sound? Yeah, sure. So the complexity of the genome itself makes this problem quite confusing uh, and challenging from uh, the, re the, the, the repeat complexity of the genome itself makes this incredibly uh, a challenging problem. Well, just working with the Broad Institute and UCSC, we have looked at a number of glioblastoma. So glioblastoma is a type of brain cancer. It's a type, uh, if you remember uh, several years ago, Ted Kennedy died of this. Uh, it's a very deadly brain cancer, and uh, looking at the brain tumor samples from glioblastoma patients versus uh, their normal DNA, you can detect a number of losses uh, 
uh, and other changes. In particular, you often see homozygous, which means both copies. Remember, you get two copies of every gene, one from mom, one from dad. Homozygous, mean, homozygous loss means you lost both mom's and dad's copy of this gene, CDKN2A-B. Uh, That's a pair of genes that are very, very important in, in keeping stability of the cells. If when you lose them, it allows essentially the cells to divide in an uncontrolled fashion. And it turns out that in almost every case we see an inactivation of both copies of this gene in glioblastoma. In particular, in this case, we could, by analyzing the reads and the pattern of the reads, um, we could determine that there was a, a very precise loss just around this gene uh, of one copy and a, and a large loss, like you lost a whole chromosome or a whole chromosome arm or a complex event on the other one in 15, in 11 uh, uh, of, of uh, 16 cases. In this case, it was activated by other, inactivated by other mechanisms other than loss. So, what happens in these mutations in cancer is amazing and I just show you uh, one of the more spectacular ones that complex loss that I referred to is in is uh, is actually chromothripsis and so what happens is <clears throat> during one of the replication events um, when you when you when you replicate the genome you actually create fragments and stitch them back together again if that process gets confused for a while it can create a lot of loose fragments and stitch them back together again the wrong way Another possibility is a high energy event can shatter the genome in multiple places. Um, in that case, we see that in fact the DNA repair mechanisms are, are absolutely blind. So in a chromothripsis event, we may end up with more than a hundred fragments of DNA and they literally uh, paste the ends back together again in a completely random configuration. The cell normally dies, but if you're lucky enough to paste some of these to, to connect the, reconnect the chromosomes, then you get an intact chromosome and some of the pieces may form these circular products, some of which may be lost, uh, but some may be retained and so you end up getting a slightly shorter chromosome with a couple of circles floating around in the cell. These are called double minute chromosomes and they're observed in the microscope through appropriate staining actually in cancer samples so they've been known for decades. This is the first time we've been able to actually dissect one and one of the reasons that we've dissected it is because these circular pieces of DNA actually occur in very many copies within the chromosome. So for instance, this circle has about 80 copies per cell. You can actually dissect what, by looking at the DNA, this piece of DNA attached to that piece of DNA, which at the other end is attached to this end of that piece of DNA and so forth, you can trace around the circle and actually see how the chromosome is formed or the double minute chromosome is formed. And in each case, these contain key genes. And this is no coincidence because the cancer is selecting. It's a, it's a, it's, this is definitely a, an evolutionary process where the cells that are more fit from the cancer point of view to reproduce are being selected out. EGFR is a very strong oncogene. That's like an accelerator pedal that drives uh, the growth. And it's appearing 80 times in this. MDM2 is uh, is something that also acts like an accelerator pedal because it, MDM2, inhibits P53 and P53 is the guardian of the cell. It's the most important cancer gene. It keeps the cell from going uncontrolled. So when you amplify a suppressor of P53, it acts like an accelerator pedal. Here's another one and you see MDM2 again. This is a completely different brain cancer, but by coincidence, and again, of course, not by coincidence, but by selection, you see the same amplification occurring. So cancer evolves through these series of events. You notice that it, uh, it's thought now that a typical cancer contains six so-called driving driver mutations, mutations that actually cause the cells to behave more cancer-like and give them survival advantage over the others. And then there are lots of passenger or neutral events. 
What happens is that at any given time, the tumor is actually a mixture of different cells, and some of the cells may have some of the drivers and some not. So each of these colors represents a class of cells that's growing within the tumor, but only these very dark ones have this last driver event. And they may eventually dominate the whole tumor, but right now they're only a fraction of the tumor tissue. And then and again, in between here, you see the normal tissue as well. So every tumor is mixed in with uh, completely normal tissue. So because a tumor is a mixture of clones, it becomes difficult to analyze what's going on. It's not like we're just reading one genome, we're reading a mixture of many genomes at once. So it's another challenge in these uh, algorithms so there are a couple of uh, approaches to clonality. In particular, we want to distinguish uh, a tumor that has, say, three types of clones, A, B, and C in it. Um, and we want to know how much is clone A, how much is clone B, how much is clone C, and what mutations are carried in clone A versus clone B versus clone C. Well, what we can do, the mutations are fairly rare. You're going to have between a dozen and a few tens of thousands of mutations. If it's, if it's uh, a lung, tumor from a smoker, probably tens of thousands of mutations because tobacco is an incredible mutagen. If it's melanoma, skin cancer from ultraviolet, probably tens of thousands of mutations. But if it's a childhood leukemia, there might only be a dozen mutations. As compared to the three million differences between the chromosome you got from mom and the chromosome chromosomes you got from dad. So there's a lot more information in these so-called alleles that you've inherited, the two different versions that you've inherited from mom and dad. Now the mutation is either going to be on the, the chromosome you got from mom or the chromosome you got from dad. So you can, you can um, sort these out. And one of the major things is copy number variation. We see you duplicate things and lose things a lot and we can distinguish between the copy that you got from mom and the copy you got from dad, these two alleles, and that helps to sort this out. In particular, here's a little diagram that shows you what you got. So in this case, this is normal DNA copy number. You got one copy, one allele from mom, one allele from dad and the total number of copies is two. But here, there's been a duplication in the tumor on, say, dad's copy, so you got two of dad's version, one of mom's version, total of three, and so forth. Here's one where you've lost both mom and dad's version. This would be like the CDKN2A case where there was a, was a vital uh, uh, tumor suppressor gene that was eliminated both copies. <clears throat> and then you can have a strong uh, duplication and you can even have duplicated both copies so you have five copies of dad and two copies of mom for example so if I break the DNA of the tumor up into pieces and plot it on a plot where this is uh, arbitrarily the majority allele fraction is the one that appears more often in the tumor and the tumor copy number on this axis I get a diagram that looks like this so this 5 2 ends up here uh, total of seven copies, five from the major allele and two from the minor allele. So the allele fraction is sitting in here um, and so forth. So you can see each one of these points corresponds to this. So it turns out that you can, you can go through the cancer genome and actually plot real data on a plot like this and, and um, you get something that looks like this. Uh, so for a very pure genome, you can recognize, um, we colored these by chromosome, you can recognize where this is like CD, uh, a hemizygous uh, deletion where you've lost one copy, this would be like CDKN2AB where you've lost both copies, and here's a copy, a single, single one of the copies was amplified and so forth. So in this, in this plot, which we call an allele state diagram, uh, developed by Zach F Sanborn at, at 5.3 Genomics now. He left my lab and formed a company. Um, this uh, tells you uh, exactly the kinds of uh, regions colored by chromosome that exist in the tumor and what their copy number status is. And you can plot this out and so you get essentially a karyotype of the, of the tumor. Um, here are uh, focal deletions uh, on 6Q, so the majority, uh, the minority allele disappears completely. Um, here's an amplification where you've got the majority allele up at copy 2. Um, 
Here's the case that we looked at before in this diagram, <coughs> CDKN2A, um, where you see that uh, first deletion um, is actually uh, a loss of the entire chromosome. So this drops down here. This middle part, the centromere is not sequenceable, so you're not seeing anything in the white centromeric region here. Um, and so it turns out that, it, that if you separate out now the clones based on these numbers, so you do a mixture decomposition on these data, you can determine that there's clone A, B, C, and D. And in fact, D has an accumulation of a lot of mutations that weren't present in A, B, and C. Similarly, C and so forth. So we can actually tentatively at least order these in terms of a time series. Uh, and we think that these are the later clones that derive from these earlier clones. And so we can time this actually and say the first thing that happened was an entire uh, loss of one of the copies of chromosome 9. And then the second thing, I'm sorry you can't really see this in the back, but there's a little white line, is the focal deletion just around CDKN29 that created clone B. This, ha this makes a lot of sense. And, and uh, the reason is that, that these large losses of a whole chromosome or a chromosome arm are very, very frequent. And so it's bound to happen first. And the second, the reason that you don't, uh, the second event is not also a large loss, is that the cell would be hosed if it lost both copies of chromosome 9. Because there's a very essential gene right next to CDKN2AB. So the only way that cancer can be a cancer is to do a precision deletion on the second one. And that's what we see time and time again. So here's the summary of this. After mixture decomposition, we see in these glioblastomas, uh, three of them are essentially monoclonal, which means one clone is completely dominating the entire tumor. Some of them have two clones, visible three, four, and these are, of course, lower bounds. There could be very minor clone variants, of course, that are below our measure, our level to measure. So this gives some idea of this, and, and it's important, uh, that's Zach's company, uh, it's important that there is, uh, there, that we would be able to identify these allele-specific structural variants, use them to de- uh, to deconvolute and, and uh, solve the mixture problem of the different clones and relate this to mute, uh, timing and ultimately we hope that will be useful in designing a, com a combinatorial therapy that will kill all the clones uh, appropriately. So um, I'm going to say a few things about how we represent genomes from the point of view of the computer science uh, the approach in the audience. Um, the first thing is we, we get these short reads and they're mapped to the reference genome in a file called BAM. Um, that's the one that we think is going to be about 100 um, gigabytes per genome when it's compressed. Then there's a file called variant call format which just calls the mutations or changes in that and doesn't report anything else. Uh, that's very small, that's only about a gig, so that's a hundred times smaller. Um, then finally, if you, once you get, what we're hoping to get to is if we read enough and we know about the pieces, the segments, like all the copy numbers, right, we know we have two copies of the segment from mom, one copy from dad, mom has these alleles, dad has these alleles, there's a mutation on dad's copy here, and then this segment connects to this segment, this connect, connects to this segment, we hope to be able to assemble what we would call a sequence graph that describes the pieces of DNA in the tumor in an actual graphical form that you can compute on and that is yet to be built. So my lab, this is where my lab is doing the most intense work. So we spend, if you want to know how I spend 70% of my day, I'm trying to design this right now. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of this at this point, but we do need a universal language. For those of you that are my age or older, you were probably subjected to these uh, toys called Tinker Toys uh, when you were a kid. Um, so think about each of these sticks as a segment of DNA and think about these connectors as ways in which those segments could be connected to each other at one end or the other. Uh, and, and of course then kids build these things out of these. And what's happening, this is actually an interesting diagram and it kind of represents the typical state of knowledge about a genome. We may know that this blue piece is connected to this 
the one, this end of this blue piece is connected to this end of this yellow piece, but the other end of the blue piece might be connected to that blue piece, or that yellow piece, or this yellow piece, and we may not know that, right? So it really is a graph that contains our uncertainty, and we may be uncertain about copy number. We may be pretty sure there's two copies of this, but we may not be absolutely sure. Now we're getting more and more, if it's a long piece, we're absolutely sure about which, uh, how many copies there are. Um, this is the technical picture for it, again, and I'm not going into the math. Um, this is a diagram of how you have a piece of DNA, you represent the ends, you can represent different possibilities. The green genome connects them in one pattern, the blue genome connects them in another, and you can represent these in a formal object called a bi-directed uh, bi uh, graph, which was actually studied in the 80s um, in graph theory. Um, they have wonderful combinatorial properties, uh, but the other thing that's important is we don't just want to represent one cancer genome. In fact, all of our genomes, including our cancer genomes, are all related, right? They're all very, very similar. So the entirety of human variation is just segments of DNA that have been segregating in our population for the last 180,000 years, passed on from parent to child. And so, by our very relatedness to each other, there is actually one massive sequence graph that describes all of human genetic variation. That's another pet project of mine, is to build this, because I was the guy that always wanted the biggest <laughs> set of toys, right? And, and, and so, given that set of toys, I could build anybody's genome, right? And, and so that's, that's an important goal, uh, and we're working towards that. The current situation is that there's one reference genome, it's basically this guy from Buffalo <laughs> that is forever anonymous and was sequenced by the Reference Human Genome Project. Um, so we want to represent more of human variation in our reference genome. There are many, many other things you can get from DNA. Um, we've talked about getting allelic variants and mutations. Um, you can compare them to standard databases like dbSNP and Cosmic that contain records of all of these, but ultimately that should be in the one big sequence graph. Um, you can get the number of copies, as we've described, of each segment of DNA and what it's connected to, what they're, what, how the copies are connected at their ends. Um, you can get the expression level also by sequencing essentially sequencing the RNA. You make complementary DNA from the RNA and you count how many times you see the RNA. That gets the expression level of a gene. It's a different type of information, although it may tell you that there's been an abnormal splice in the DNA to make this weird transcript. Then you can get what's called the methylation status of the promoter. So it turns out that upstream of each gene is a regulatory region and when the DNA is methylated that may shut down the gene so, um, flag me on the timing here. Okay. Um, and, and it turns out that you can read that indirectly by DNA sequencing methodologies as you can read other modifications to the DNA. The DNA is wound around protein called histones and whatever is chemical modifications exist on those histones describe how the DNA is going to be used. These are so-called epigenetic modifications. What genes, what proteins uh, that are called transcription factors might bind to the DNA to either turn on or turn off transcription of a gene. Um, so all of these, and then finally functional genomics, you can, you can um, inhibit uh, the RNA with different inhibitors and then count how many times the RNA is still there and recognize where which inhibitors are inhibiting which genes and then look at the cellular effect. What does it do to the cell? All of that is from DNA readout. So we have a massive amount of DNA information that's not directly for the purpose of reading DNA bases but for reading other aspects of biology. All of that information will be implicit in this massive DNA database which makes it somewhat complicated. Why do we care about all of that? Because, you know, I've incredibly oversimplified the story. It's like, well, you figure out whether there's a BRAF mutation or not, and you give them vermorafenib. It's not going to be that simple. And the thing I have to emphasize the most is that all of the activities 
of, that are engendered by these mutations depend on the network itself. So this is a great paper uh, if we look more carefully at glioblastoma in a more global way. I've given you, again, I'm taking brain cancer as a simple example for this so you can drill down a little bit. There, there are a lot of different mutations. So each one of these ovals is a different gene that's very commonly altered in brain cancer. For example, here's the gene MDM2 that we saw. The red means that the, in cancer, in brain cancer, that the activity is increased. So red means you see in cancer increased activity. Blue means you see decreased activity. So we see in brain cancer increased activity of MDM2. We know what, why that happens, and, it, and there's a little annotation over here, amplification in 14%. We just saw one with 80 copies of this sucker, right? So that's a really good, uh, a really good example of, yeah, we do see this gene amplified a lot. Now, why does that cause cancer? It causes it indirectly. As I said before, MDM2 inhibits P53. So this little T means inhibit. That's an inhibitory interaction. And P53 controls this, and it actually sends the cell into program death called apoptosis if anything wonky happens. So P53 is preventing you from getting cancer all the time by as soon as the cell goes rogue, it sends it off to suicide. That's a really important gene, and we see that in some cancers, like we recently did a study of ovarian cancer, virtually every cancer had P53 inactivated. So directly inactivated by mutation. In brain cancer, this thing will be inactivated. We can prove that it's inactivated in 87% of the cases, but often not directly by mutation, but indirectly by something. And in fact, we can see this, our old friend CDKN2A, right, actually is an inhibitor of the inhibitor. So, so now you get the logic of biology, right? Losing this increases this, which inhibits this. So that's another way you can have problems. And if you see, the logic is the same. Losing this is bad because it inhibits, it, it, it increases something on this level. Increasing something on this level is bad because it decreases this guy, and this guy protects the cell. So all of these work together. And in fact, when we talk about statistical power, the fact that this is amplified, CDK6 in 1% of the cases, we didn't have a big enough sample to say that that's significant. That's actually background noise. But in the context of this logic, all of that together, meaning this whole thing has a net effect of reducing retinoblastoma 1, activity in 78% of the cases, that, believe me, is highly statistical, statistically significant. So we can suspect that that actually is a driver of the cancer because of its position in the network. So how do we get that? this? There are a number of machine-readable large-scale network topologies, and you can download them from any of these sources. Uh, Josh Stewart in, in, at UCSC has a large group that's been doing this and what you read out of the literature is things like this little diagram. So you read that the gene MDM2 inhibits the gene P53, and you've got to take that diagram and make a graphical model out of it, make a, a model that you can reason on probabilistically. So what we do is we have some states, uh, what Josh does, he has some states for that model the, the status of MDM2, some states that model the interaction and the same thing for every one of uh, the thousands of genes in, the, in, the, um, in, in, in a typical cell. Now to blow this up a little bit, here's what the graph looks like with these two genes. So for MDM2, there's actually four hidden states or latent variables which represent in turn the activity or amount of the DNA the activity or amount of the messenger RNA created by the DNA, the activity or amount of the protein, and the activity or amount of the active protein. And it turns out there are chemical modifications to activate proteins afterwards. 
And then the same thing for P53. So this is, we call these the central dogma states. Now we can estimate each state you can think about as being minus one, zero, or plus one for simplicity in terms of a variable. In fact, it's implemented that way. You can estimate these states based on evidence. So there might be evidence that there's 80 copies of MDM2 here, and that causes you to believe by belief propagation that there's a lot of extra DNA, which then propagates through to say that there's a lot of extra messenger RNA, protein, and active protein. And then this link is the key one. This is an inhibitory link, which is built into the system from the diagram. That says that, that I will inhibit the production of P53 protein, and so that's going to be down, blue, that's going to be down, and therefore the cell will be unable to go into apoptosis. So this is how you convert um, these signaling pathways uh, into actual deductions from a statistical point of view. And applying this, we see uh, what we can do is essentially label two different cohorts uh, and look at, at, the, at the, the neighborhoods of influence as they propagate through these uh, diagrams and look at specific clustering. Now in this case, each one of these is a concept like apoptosis or activated protein. Um, this was a small network of, uh, of 87. So along, uh, along the, each row is a, is a separate pathway and then each column is a patient sample. This is ovarian cancer. And you can see that there's, in the cancer relative to the normal, there's a huge activity around this one network. This is a diagram, this extra, this is diagramming this extra activity. Um, again, this is just taking the underlying graphical model and superimposing for each sample as a spoke, its abnormal activity, and that immediately tells the biologist what's going on. There's a defect in cell cycle and damage repair. And you can also cluster, like you would microarray data, if you're used to clustering gene expression data, you can cluster these active protein, estimated active protein levels which can be estimated from multiple sources and integrated into this model and they actually give a cleaner separation. So if you cluster based on this, we see a purple class of patients who on this survival curve survive better than the rest of the ovarian cancer patients in this test. And when Broad, Baylor and, and our group tried to cluster the raw expression data, we got no separation. So adding biological knowledge helps you separate out one class of patients which might survive longer than the another in this case. That's another reason why we are interested in this. Um, I will go through this quickly um, because I know we're, we're low on time. But another important source of information that I talked about with RNAi and all of this is that you can take cancer cells and propagate them in a dish, essentially. They grow, oftentimes they grow quite robustly and then you can subject them to different drugs. And that information can be very helpful. But there was a big question about whether it's modeling the actual cancer or not. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. And one of the problems was that when you were using microarray, <laughs> Whew, okay, the, some, somebody's trying to tell us something. Um, when you're using microarray, oftentimes if you if you look at actual tissue, in this case this is a breast study, so if you looked at microarray from actual breast tumor tissue versus microarray from these cells growing in a dish and you try to cluster, you get two clusters, right? <laughs> growing in a dish versus coming from the real, uh, the real breast tissue and that doesn't do you any good at all. Um, so what's nice about these pathways is if you convert everything into this pathway activity thing, it kind of normalizes and neutrals out a lot of that. And so when we did this, this is a case where there's 47 cell line samples. These are the, the everywhere where you see green, uh, that's cell line sample. These are the activities of the different pathway entities going across this way. This is the sample again. Cell line samples and normal breast samples, 182, uh, uh, sorry, tissue uh, samples from, from, from breast cancer. And then you cluster them and you do see quite distinct clusters, but you notice that all the green are not segregated into one cluster or not. And in fact, these clusters make sense. And this cluster is actually a well-known cluster 
These are so-called basal breast cancers, which are the most dangerous type of breast cancer. And we had several basal cell lines and we had several basal actual tumor tissues and they clustered together, which indicated that we're seeing real biology and not am I growing in a dish or not. Uh, and that is, was very, very encouraging. So we hope by these pathway signatures to get down to that. So you can look at group A versus group B and, and color the activities, whether I'm up, whether the activity of this is up or down. Yes, you're up. Yeah, just, uh, just wrap it up. Okay, wrap it up. Um, and, 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 and so if you look at basal versus luminal, you can actually distinguish uh, things that are over, overly active in basal versus luminal and overly active in luminal versus basal. So a number of studies are using this information now to better understand the underlying cancer mechanism. So this is all about getting at mechanism, which is a prelude to getting at treatment. I'm actually at the end here. Um, finally, if you wanted to, so this is all kind of unsupervised uh, clustering with a, with a Bayesian net. Um, in the end, you get a signature out of these things. You get an activity over, over thousands of different um, uh, biologically relevant measurements or inferred measurements, you want to take that vector and put it through a machine learning and predict whether the patient should, will benefit from treatment A or treatment B or how long they will live. And we have a massive machine learning pipeline to try to do that. Um, so finally, it's very, very important to establish international standards for data storage and exchange so that we can all participate in this process. Um, the, the key thing um, that that will open up is this learning, automatic learning cycle from every new cancer case. And, and I think this has to be driven on top of a not-for-profit platform for a number of reasons. We can talk about that. Um, and it will support a number of social changes in medicine. There's too much siloing, there's too much secrecy of information and not sharing of information in medicine at this point. And we do have to come up with a social change uh, accompanying the other kind of Internet 2.0 way of thinking about this. That has to happen in medicine. But the number one issue is we need statistical power to dissect these complicated networks. So I want to thank uh, the, the sequencing centers, Broad, WashU, Baylor, Cancer Genome Atlas, Stand Up to Cancer uh, participated in the, the breast cancer study. We were on the dream team for Stand Up to Cancer. We're, we're on prostate and others now. Uh, the International Cancer Consortium, my colleagues at UCSF and other institutions. And of course my funding and that's the, the cancer team. Thanks.